Uh, welcome everyone to GABMAC 2021, the Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. Uh, today's session is uh, a beha Veterinary Behavioural Health and Disasters, a call to action by Professor Gary rogan Uh You can read more about Gary's rather impressive uh, career and expertise in veterinary disaster management at our website. You just go to GABMAC go under, go under speakers, speakers. you'll find a lot of good information about his um, extensive background. Before we start today, we had some basic housekeeping. Uh, you'll find that the Zoom chat feature has been disabled. Um, but if you have a question, please use the Q&A box on Zoom and um, we will be able to put those questions to Gary towards the end of his presentation. Uh, we'll also be providing a poll at some stage, um, which will be helping um, Gary sort of get a, 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 an assessment of the, of the room and audience. When you end today's session, you'll be able to receive a short survey evaluating today's session, and we welcome you to do that. And just a reminder that, um, as with all our presentations, they are they are uh, being recorded and they'll be available at part of the GADMAC award ceremony in July. Um, certainly, I'm also getting the echo. Um, it's twice as bad because it's coming from me, um, but I will mute my microphone very shortly. Uh, and in doing that, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Gary rogan um to talk about veterinary behavioral health. Welcome, Gary. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much, and and uh, thank you for everyone who's attending and to GEDMEC for putting together such an extraordinary conference in during extraordinary times. Um, you can see on the lower left, uh, in addition to being the director of One Health at Lincoln Memorial University, I'm also the chair of the OIE's Ad Hoc Committee on Disasters, and this group over a period of several years are writing several uh, disaster guidelines for use by National Veterinary Services. Um, as a disclaimer, I always say that uh, the views that are presented today are my views and not necessarily those of OIE, GADMIC, uh, Lincoln Memorial University, or my wife. Now, with that bit of humor, um, that's about the last piece of humorous part that we're going to see because what we're dealing with in veterinary behavior, health, and disasters is a serious issue. An example comes from what people have said. Uh, in a survey we'll talk about later in the free text area, this is one of the comments. I had a major, major depressive episode. I was hospitalized for 30 days and back to work after six months. And this for me is, a, is typical, or not typical, but exemplary of the types of issues that we see as we deploy uh, in disasters. And it's something that, that we really need to pay attention to, and I see it as a significant issue for all of us that are involved in animal disaster activities. We, this is not a new thing. If we go back approximately 25 years in Australia, in the Yoni's disease episodic that was looking to decrease and get rid of Yoni's disease, it involved depopulation or killing, removal of animals, and that those people that were involved in it suffered traumatic mental health problems. And finally, because of the hostilities, the exhaustion and responders burnout, the program was suspended. If we move forward to about 20 years ago, we see with the UK foot and mouth disease, livestock farmers and families had enormous uh, emotional losses. Um, and veterinarians and government officials also that, who had to implement the losses suffered as well. Now, in this particular discussion, we are talking about veterinarians, and that just has to do with the, with the uh, scope of the survey that, that we did. But understand that not only do we have emotional issues for veterinarians, but for technicians, for support people, and the livestock farmers and families. And if we looked at the UK, those even went beyond other areas because livestock farmers, as horrific as this was, um, did get compensation. But others, such as people who own bed and breakfast and inns in the countryside where people would visit, didn't get compensation. So not only 
did they have the emotional part of seeing this, but they also had economic losses that were not appreciated uh, as much as, say, the farmers were. In the same year as, as foot and mouth disease got into the Netherlands, um, we see that there was uh, traumatic stress uh, that occurred with veterinarians, and 40% of the veterinarians showed signs of this stress even after six years. Uh, reasons that they saw were decreased number of animals that they had to treat to, uh, affecting their, uh, their incomes, change in regulations and confrontation with, with producers and farmers. So, so we see here in foot and mouth disease two evidences of this traumatic activity. We move forward to about 11 years ago and we see that this again happened with foot and mouth disease and veterinarians and technicians and including clerical people that were involved in control still had post-traumatic stress disorder after two years. So this, this we're seeing a pattern uh, of continued issues with with whether you call it PTSD, whether you're calling behavioral health, mental health, or psychological health, um, across a whole spectrum of, of animal issues. Terry Whiting and Colleen Marion uh, looked at this and identified it about 10 years ago um, and taught, named this a perpetration induced traumatic stress, and it was a risk for veterinarians that were involved in the destruction of healthy animals. And one of the comments that, that we got back in our survey in the open text part said, I, I didn't become a veterinarian to kill animals. That's not what I wanted to do. And so we see this in, in terms of disasters that are transboundary disease or, or what we would call foreign animal disease disasters, where it, in order to control a disease to, to protect the national herd of a country uh, and their economy, Animals, both sick and healthy, have to be depopulated. So if we take a look at what kind of guidelines we have on this, um, we'll find that actually it's pretty sparse, that we look at the OIE Terrestrial Health Code, which is a two-volume uh, code that's updated uh, every year, and there's little mention of behavior health, either for the owners or responders. Uh, there's one small area in talking about depopulation that talks about a competency of awareness of psychological effects on the farmer, team members, and the general public, um, but it doesn't provide any guidelines or any standards uh, that should be used. Another document that, that we've used globally is the Livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards, or LEGS document. And in here, there are only three lines that talk about behavior health of either the owners or the responders. And another major uh, guideline that we use for animal disasters it is the Good Emergency Management Practices, or GEMP, uh, from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And in this, this document, there's only one paragraph that discusses behavior health. But if we go back and look at historically, you know, what the numbers of people that are involved, the depth of the problem and how long it lasted, that, that we really have a paucity of guidelines and information that, that we have, plus all of these that we've discussed so far had to do with foreign animal disease. Diseases like foot and mouth disease, um, that African swine fever, avian influenza, um, these are all animal disease type issues and don't cover the entire scope of disasters that, that we've looked or look at. Now, one guideline that does go into more depth in terms of identifying the issue as well as guidelines in terms of how to deal with it comes from the USDA, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, um, in their Fed prep, the Foreign Animal Disease Preparedness and Response, and all part of the National Animal Health Emergency Management System. And so for those of you who do not have guidelines to work with and want a starting point, this is a good starting point to take a look. And if you look down in the lower left uh, of the picture, down below where it says Nahams, uh, this goes back to, to 2011. So for 10 years, we've had some pretty significant guidelines out there. But part of the question is, 
where they used and how they used. And again, these are primarily because you can see it's uh, fed prep. This again is focused on foreign animal disease preparedness. Going back to our guidelines from the OIE disaster uh, committee, and one of the first guidelines that we wrote, that we know veterinary services and national veterinary services have to deal with foreign animal diseases. But the reality is that, that we have all kinds of disasters uh, that are out there that whether it's written into their uh, requirements or not, veterinarians and veterinary services and animal care individuals will be called upon to assist, whether it's in floods like we saw in Europe in 2014, uh, with volcanoes, with wildfires, earthquakes, terrorism, and technological disasters or conflict. In any case, we are going to be involved, animals are going to be involved, and all responders will be involved. So to get a handle on this, we, we uh, did a global behavior health survey. And again, the, the focus of this was veterinarians, but we'll talk later about how this needs to be expanded. And, and we started off with a premise and then some questions. The premise is that there are behavioral health issues with veterinarians responding to disasters. Now we know from prior, from prior uh, re, you know, published reports that with foreign animal diseases there were, um, but we don't have much information beyond that. It's pretty much been limited. And in this case, we've used the term behavior health partially because mental health or psychological health sometimes will carry a stigma with it um, that uh, if you have bad mental health, you, you must be uh, insane. There must be something wrong with you. So we talk about behavior health and this, this issue because of the stigma. So our questions were, what's the scope of this by disaster type and by locations? What was the scale of this issue by the numbers and percentages and how significant were they? And finally, what, what gaps exist in our current guidelines and policies? So to do this survey, we, we sent out a series of questions through Qualtrics, and it was an anonymous, convenient snowball survey. And the snowball part means that we sent it out um, to uh, just over 1,100 uh, email addresses of veterinarians that, that we had either from OIE, from various disaster conferences I had been involved in, personal contacts, uh, and they were allowed to send it on to other people. So uh, we don't know of those original ones, you know, how many sent it on, how many eventually saw it, but we ended up with 240 validated responses. Uh, responses were, were taken out uh, if they answered the survey, if in fact they were not a veterinarian or if they had not participated in a disaster. So what kind of results did we see? Well, to start with, we saw that 50% of people had at least one behavioral health symptom that was associated with their disaster response. This kind of answers part of the question is, how, what's the scale of this? How big is it? 50%, and these numbers pretty much parallel what we saw in the early reports on foreign animal disease. If we take a look at disaster type, um, on the far left, we have animal disease, then natural disasters, military conflict, human disease, and technological disasters. And what we see here is behavioral health symptoms were reported in every single disaster type category that we had. Before we did the survey, our assumption or our guess would be we would see a higher number of people reporting behavioral health issues in animal disease disasters because of the fact we were doing uh, depopulation, killing of healthy animals, which is not what veterinarians did. So as a bit of surprise and also opening our eyes to things when we saw that approximately 50%, 49% of, of veterinarians had a behavioral health uh, symptom reported um, in animal disease, but the same number, 48% saw this in natural disasters. So it, it opens our eyes to the fact we have to consider that not only with foreign animal diseases that we have studied uh, behavioral health in, but in disasters in general, that, that we have to consider what, what the impacts would be. We found it interesting too, that there were higher percentages of people reporting uh, behavioral health issues uh, when dealing with human disease or with military conflict or terrorist attack. 
<coughs> pardon me, these higher, the, these percentages were higher, but with the numbers being as low as they are, that, that could bias the results. But at least I think it opens up the door for further investigation. If we take a look by region, uh, we see that in each of the OIE regions that we looked at, Africa, Asia Pacific, Canada, US, North America, basically, uh, Europe and Latin America, in every single region, uh, there were behavioral health reports that, that were indicated. Um, they range from a low of 44% in Europe up to a high of 54% in, um, in Africa and Canada, United States. Um, and, but really relatively close numbers for, as we look at them uh, across all of the areas. So not only do we see the uh, behavioral health issues reported in all types of disasters, we see them reported in fairly consistent numbers across every geographic region that, that we survey. We looked earlier and talked about the guidelines and standards and, uh, and standard operating procedures that were available. And of the respondents, we had 60% did not have any awareness of guidelines, uh, standards, or SOPs, standard operating procedures for deployment. Um, in terms of those that were trained, uh, because this is a significant issue, we think it's something to be trained for. Only about a quarter, 23% reported receiving any training before deployment. Only 16 reported having support during deployment. So while we had 50% of all respondents saying they had symptoms, uh, only 16% only of all respondents, or about a third of those reporting symptoms, had any indication of any support that, that was provided during deployment. If we take a look at the support after deployment, the numbers go down even more. Only 13% had any uh, support after the event. And if we take a look at symptoms, and now you can see the range of symptoms that, that we took, took a look at. On the far left is, is all types of symptoms. Those that on the darker blue is, is reported during the event, uh, and the lighter blue after the event. You can, and after the event, our timeline was six months. So, so you can see all of the types of, of uh, symptoms that people reported. And in fact, for a high percentage of them, they stayed. So remember we had 50% that reported a symptom at all. And of these 64% had symptoms after six months. Of note for us is that some of the more reported symptoms uh, such as mood swings, depression, nightmares, and suicidal thoughts did not decrease after six months, whereas, whereas what we would consider maybe milder symptoms such as sleep loss and anxiety um, did decrease. So that these are consistent with what we have seen actually with uh, combat uh, soldiers that re returning from duty. And in, in some cases, as we've discussed, we had discussed offline earlier, is that the team, the people that deployed together they can share feelings and thoughts about what they did and what they were involved in and, and have people understand. But after you get home, remember only 13% received any kind of support afterwards. Um, sometimes you just can't tell your friends and families what you were doing because some of it was, was too awful and they, they don't want to hear about it. So with this, we have some conclusions, and they're not hard to come by conclusions, but, but the first one is we're gonna say uh, that behavior health associated is a significant issue. And, and I forgot to mention my, uh, my co-investigator uh, with this is Ms. Kimberly Curtis, also at Lincoln Memorial University. Um, so behavioral health is a significant issue as we see it that the issues are present in multiple types of disasters, every single type of disasters that we, uh, that we identified, and through all geographic regions, that the knowledge of the standards, guidelines, and SOPs is marginal, training and support for behavior health is generally deficient. Um, and so there are many, many more uh, data points that came out of this survey um, that uh, more than we have time to cover today. And, but some of these, many of these will be covered hopefully in the, our paper as it's published in the Australian Journal. But some other comments we had, and we, we were asking people for specific um, 
the specific open comments about the support they received and what was good, but many used these comments to open up very broadly about what their feelings were. Um, many months later, I was still getting somewhat emotional describing events. Someone said, and these, these were few, we had three comments in all of our comments, uh, I don't think there's a need for behavioral health support. Um, these, some of these comments, well, they're very valid as those individual opinions, also become a little, little disturbing for me because if this is your supervisor or team leader, um, maybe not recognizing how often this is occurring. Someone else said deployments of all kinds for all professions can result in forms of PTSD and should be managed as such. Um, an individual wrote down, I broke down with panic attacks, but I wasn't the only one. And they said basically every, everyone in their leadership uh, chain broke down at some time. Uh, this is one similar that said we don't need this. We at in and I won't name the country, but they named their country. We in our country don't need behavioral health support because we're intelligent individuals and we know how to handle this. And again, this is, um, I appreciate their candor and, and that, but it may represent an, a lack of understanding where an individual may not need it, but certainly a high percentage of people did. And then someone asked, when we asked what could be done, they said, I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure but we need some help. So if we take a look at this, I, I see our, our current behavioral health issues as a bit of a, as an iceberg. We're only seeing the, the tip of this. We have all of our population at risk. And if we look at veterinarians as the population here, um, veterinarians have a higher suicide rate than almost every profession and higher than, than the national uh, averages for general population in most countries that have been surveyed. Then we have those that are exposed because of exposure to a disaster. And some of those will have low level transient behavioral health issues, maybe a little anxiety and losing some sleep. Some may have those that persist. And we saw 64% of the people had some persistent of issues. Then we'll have high level tra uh, transient behavioral health. And those might be things like, like the suicide ideation, um, and, and mood swings and nightmares. But remember, a lot of those persisted. In fact, they, they, those that on the highest level of types of behavioral health issues did not go away. So we have in, in our paper uh, probably 15 recommendations, but I'm going to distill them down into a few at this point, is that we need guidelines, standards, and best practices for behavioral health uh, to be established that national veterinary services and animal response organizations need to incorporate this into their disaster preparedness and response plans. We need more research to be funded and conducted to understand underlying risk factors, best practices for building resilience and how to mitigate uh, behavioral health risk. And this research needs to include not just veterinarians as we had in this study, but all animal disaster responders and stakeholders, also considering impacted communities and, and individuals. So at this point, I would say we have a call to action. We see this, my co-PI co and I see this as a serious problem. Many others have told me the same. Action needs to be taken. And if it's not us, then who's going to do it? And if it's not now, when are we, when are we going to do it? So let's act now. Well, it's easy to say, and we've got a broad audience that we will be looking at this, but I want to act now, but what can I do? Well, at your individual organization, one is you can seek out those that may need help. Uh, identify workers, uh, people that have deployed with you, uh, get the group together, may, kind of find out how they're doing, seek those out. Look at your organization behavioral health guidelines and SOPs. Find out if you even have any. Uh, is, is there, is there you know, any, anything that is, is available uh, that you're using for a standard. Then start a working group to add behavioral health, training, education, and SOPs to your organization uh, response capability. And then at every level that you can, advocate for health, safety, and wellness. So it's not just behavioral health, but we heard earlier uh, that about health and safety issues. Looking for health, safety, and wellness 
for all animal deployers at the, or your organization basis, at a regional basis, national basis, and international basis. Um, and with that, I've tried to leave some time for discussion. I'll, I'll open it up for discussion um, and see see if I if I will get rid of. I guess I'm going to stop sharing my slides and see if I can see the chat. Uh, Steve, if you can read any uh, any questions or chat to me. Um, and while and then while we're doing this, we're going to put on, we're just put up a poll uh, for people to respond to. Um, and just asking, do you know anyone who's suffered behavioral health effects? This is an anonymous poll, um, so just give us a little sense of what's going on. So Steve, if you could answer the question, and for those who are watching me, if my eyes were going up, it's because my laptop screen uh, broke today and I'm trying to watch, watch my slides on, on a, projected to a TV. Okay, Steve, please. Sure, Chris. Um, a number of questions. So given that this is another important factor contributing to poor mental well-being in veterinarians, should all veterinary curricula include training to recognize the signs and to moderate these challenges? So in, in my opinion, I would say yes, it, it should. It, it, um, that we, we, we in our college are starting a course on resilience and, and we're seeing that that our students need uh, need um, they need tools to be able to be resilient. It's tough being a veterinarian. It's tough being a technician and working these things. So, so I I think part of this needs to be incorporated into um, into all curriculum for technicians, for for veterinarians, and for responders. Um, so yes, the answer absolutely is a great question. And you mentioned um, Young's disease, and I, I remember I, I sat on a national um, government exercise regarding a foot and mouth uh, exercise in, in New Zealand. And the only solution that was put forward uh, by essentially the, the, um, the ministry responsible was to eliminate um, the disease through um, depopulation and, and no other no other options were put up. Um, and I was wearing a, a Ministry of Social Development looking at sort of psychological impacts on the community. And I said, isn't there another option? You know, what about vaccination? But they didn't even put vaccination on the table because the impact in terms of the trading stand down um, period uh, of either, you know, if you're depopulating, you can return to international trade, trade a lot sooner. But I did find that really interesting that that um, those options weren't even dis discussed, the impacts on the farmers, the impacts, and, and using Yon's disease to say, look, they had to abandon that because of the, the, the mental um, you know, impact. So I, I do, the other day we had a, a, um, a presentation from Jackson Z, and, and I still think about what's the solution because in that livestock carrier that overturned, there were 13,000 sheep. Um, what do you do in terms of the, you know, the humane destruction of, of 13,000 sheep? Is it actually something that you would expect a vet to do? Or is it something you would actually expect a slaughterman to do uh, in terms of being used to that, that scale of, of, of euthanasia? But then that begs the other question uh, we just then pushing that burden onto another group at the expense. Right. So yeah, I'd, I'm keen to say, have your thoughts on those sort of, those big challenging incidents. Okay. So, so I think, you know, going to the foreign animal disease thing, certainly the UK's experience with foot and mouth disease in 2001 um, really opened a lot of people's eyes in terms of how this would be done in terms of animal welfare in terms of public acceptance and in, in terms of the, the human welfare that, that's involved. And so in the United States, uh, we had basically, you know, a, a ring, ring quarantine zone and slaughter process, which uh, now they, they're after seeing the UK, no one wants to see those burning pyres again. And so, so I think the, the approaches to that are are different now. That's in that's in the foreign animal disease side. In large scale disasters altogether, 
um, that I think the, the plan, like we've heard before, planning, 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 and exercising and thinking what the implications are, you know, how you're going to deal with large animal populations, um, whether they're laboratory animals, zoo animals, you know, and what are the trigger points and who's going to do it. Um, and, and I agree with you, I mean, to say, okay, well, veterinarians went to school to save animals, so we'll let the slaughter, slaughter individuals do this, but it's still, it's still killing. And so we have, to, we have to look at that circle of human welfare, animal welfare, see how they intersect and look at and consider those, everything that we have to do, what we would do to mitigate uh, is suffering for animals and suffering for people. Uh, next question. Uh, how do you think the underlying issues with the behavioral health of veterinarians in general have influenced the interpretation of the impacts of exposure to a disaster? Yeah, I, uh, that's a great question. And I think that's one that we need more research on. I mean, there were some of the, some of the um, uh, studies we had, or you know, research that we had done, literature research, you know, I had talked that, you know, as, as many as five to 7% of veterinarians uh, in the US and some in the UK, those were the main studies been done, had underlying uh, behavioral health or psychological health and mental health issues. So if you put them then in a more stressed situation, uh, it could just exacerbate that. So, so it's a great question. I don't have an answer to it, except that, um, you know, if you're already fragile and then are put into, and then put into a high stress situation, I think the risk factors are there. So, so we, we need to know, you know, what, what are predisposing factors and some of the things we surveyed for, but couldn't get enough numbers is, you know, how about the frequency? And we saw this when I was in the military looking at, um, at post-traumatic stress disorder from deployers. Um, you know, the, the length of deployment, the severity of the deployment, the, um, the frequency of deployment, were there gender issues, were there regional issues? Uh, if, if, we take, if we take farm kids who had grown up uh, slaughtering you know, livestock on the farm, are they more resilient to, um, to killing an animal than someone who has only been an urban individual working with pets? So it's a great question. Uh, and I think these, that's part of the further research that needs to be done. And it's great. We're getting lots and lots of questions. So lots of interest in your, in your topic today, Gary. Um, Chris has made a comment here saying triage skills and large scale disasters can be taught. When you have well understood criteria for decision making, this can mitigate the stress of decision making in, in his experience. Yeah, the, and it, a, absolutely. And, and some of the comments we got back in the survey had to do with confusing, um, confusing directions from higher headquarters, uh, conflicting processes, uh, excess workload. Um, just it's like, well, you don't have time to rest. You don't have time to take off. You don't have time to take care of yourself because we have so much to do. So I, I Chris, absolutely right. I think this is, uh, uh, th this is, you know, that if we just look at the everything we do in a response start to finish, um, there are issues involved. And it's been, I, I have to admit, it's been a long time. I, I kind of went quickly from field work into headquarters work. And so I was the son of a gun or worse word who, who was in the headquarters. But even for me, without hands on dealing with trauma of animals, um, it was, you know, it was tense. It was, you know, I lost sleep. I had anxiety working with Hurricane Katrina from a distance. And yet every night I had a hot meal and I had my own bed to sleep in and I had a safe environment. And people are talking about not having a bed, not having food, not having a safe environment to work in. And so all of these big issues. And I think that's one of the one of the barriers is that I think as people respond to these disasters, they have a genuine interest to help others. And so they triage people's needs, including their own. And they, and they think that in a lot of cases, well, yes, I'm experiencing this, but there's someone out there that is doing something worse or enduring something more severe. So therefore, uh, 
you know, the concerns that I've got aren't as actually as bad. And that sort of delegitimizes um, you know, people's own feelings and emotions, I think, to some degree. Sure. And, and I think, you know, one of, the, one of the symptoms that we had in the survey had to do with uh, b being able to deal with coworkers. And about 30% uh, identified that they were having trouble with that. So not only is it the individual that's infected, affected, but it's, it's also the effectiveness of our response in our organization. Another um, comment here from Catherine. Uh, she says, I have worked with a lot of citizen rescuers following the California wildfires and seeing a lot of burnout. To put it mildly, with people working late into the night rescuing fire cats for months, are there ways to identify signs of burnout in, in volunteer rescuers? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And I, I think at this point, um, you know, if you're talking about large scale organization, it would be a little difficult, but the, at this point, it, I think it becomes a team issue and, and uh, things that people discussed in, um, in the free text and things we've experienced would be, you know, having, having a debrief every day, having a hot wash, you know, letting people talk about it. Uh, when you recognize, you know, if people aren't eating at the meals or if they're, or if they're kind of shutting down and not engaging with other people, you, you get them offline. Um, in, um, you know, in the military, when we first were talking about PTSD several years ago, I mean, one of the one of the biggest things they called it was uh, three hots in a cot. You know, you get, give someone three hot meals and a good place to sleep and rest, and give them you know twenty four to forty eight hours off. The other thing that came from that is, unless they're truly in serious psychological distress where you need a professional, if if they leave the area, it tends to get worse, and so. You know, team cohesiveness and awareness, I think, uh, are some of the key, the, the key issues there. And again, you, you guys are having great, great, great questions. And there's been quite a bit of interest about your proposed course on resilience. Um, can you touch a bit more on that? What are you planning to, to um, create and what, will it, what may it include? Um, yeah, so it, this is nascent. I mean, we, we just started about two weeks ago and building the framework of, of resilience. So um, we're, we're bringing in multiple healthcare. We, we work within a One Health Arena. So we're working with our medical school, the nursing school and others. And we're bringing in um, our social workers. We're bringing in uh, those that have worked in, in, the, in the psychology arena. We, we're not experts in this. We recognize the, the issues, but as veterinarians, veterinarians think they can do any everything. And, they do, trust me, <laughs> and Steve's laughing. Uh, but, but we can't, and so we're, we're bringing together a, a, a whole group. Um, when we get this done, um, you, you have my contact information. When we get the framework of this put together, I'd be happy to share it, um, but this is, this is a, a multidisciplinary uh, resilience course. It'll be a, it's just a one-hour course. And now we see uh, the poll results uh, where really, you know, mirroring what we saw before in our survey report, 62%, a little bit higher. One of the things about the surveys in this is that people who have had an experience may be more likely to answer than others. So if we do surveys in the future, we need to know the denominator of everybody. Um, and then those, you know, no and none sure. So, um, this is, I, I appreciate this because if this many of us recognize this is, this is an issue, um, I think collectively we can go forward, but we can also individually go forward. You don't have to wait for it to come from the national level or an academic level. You can start at your own organization level. Well, I think we'll wrap up there for questions today, but thank you very much, uh, Professor Gary rogan Jewey. Um, you are a true pioneer, and I'm glad that you're championing this. It's always a lot, uh, it's, it'd be a lot easier to champion these issues when we have um, leaders such as yourselves championing it as a real and bona fide issue. So right. thank you for your courage uh, on this topic. <laughs> well, thank you, Stephen. And I'll, and I'll say for, 
you know, working through OIE and, and FAO, we're trying to get this inserted at top level document level. So it gives other countries and other organizations a top level guidance to work with. Um, but you can see from the, from the NAHAMS and, and what the USDA did, it still didn't trickle down. And so while we're working at a top down basis also, I encourage all of you to work on a bottom up basis and work at the local, because as you know, all disasters are local and all behavioral health responses are local. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for the opportunity and thank you for this great program you've put together. Thanks, Gary, for joining us here at GABMAC 2021. Um, we'll be finishing up very soon, but before we do, um, I'm just gonna hand over to uh, Mel Taylor, who just has an update on a replacement activity for our virtual cafe. Are you there, Mel? I am indeed, Steve. And um, sitting here listening to that last presentation as a psychologist, and as I have have the food, have the uh, the room here, I uh, just want to say how important this work is. And um, you know, there's a lot of us out there that are really interested in this area. So more of this, please, for next year. Um, going back on to uh, what I've been asked to talk about on Monday, um, on day eight of our program, we have scheduled at the four o'clock Brisbane time, um, a virtual cafe session. What we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be having uh, an opportunity for people to come and interact with each other, to take part in our first ever GADMAC trivia quiz, um, to win the prestigious title of uh, GADMAC champions and uh, take that forward. So if it seems like it's your kind of thing, do come along. Um, we're going to be putting out a link to register for this because we are going to have to limit numbers because we'll be using breakout rooms and, and making that um, opportunity to, to talk with each other possible. So if you're interested, please keep an eye on your emails and the websites and Steve will send out some information about registration for that for Monday at four o'clock Brisbane time. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. And um, as we continue with GABMAC 2021, our next session is in an hour and 10 minutes roughly, and that will be with Dr. A.K. Sinha from India talking about managing animal disasters in developing countries, a livelihood perspective. Now, the other day, um, we had a time zone uh, challenge and we were unable to hear from Dr. Minden Buswell talking about the uh, NASA AEP or NASAP. Um, we're just in negotiations with her to see if we can run that session uh, and that session will hopefully be run uh, on Monday um, at nine o'clock uh, AEST time. Um, we'll do a little update once I get confirmation uh, with that. So thanks for tuning in uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the, you at the next session. Uh, thanks for our presenters to date and in particular a huge thank you to Gary for his leadership on this important topic, which affects us all. All right, thanks everyone, and thanks for joining GADMAC.